singing and he's preaching and uh, that's where I want to be still in 35 years. Amen. Uh, I think I'm good. Thank you. It is so good to be here with you and uh, we have been uh, excited and uh, have just been filled with great expectancy uh, to be here with you at your camp meeting. Uh, it's been about 15 years, I think, since the last time I was here. And at that time, I was a student at American Indian College, and we were ministering to the youth in... Uh... Just all distracted me. It's good to see you, bro. Uh, we were ministering in that... Uh in that facility there that apparently just holds the benches now. But it's been that long since uh, since I've been here, and um, I'm just so excited uh, for the opportunity to, to come and to join in with what God has been doing uh, this entire week and last week. I told Pastor Marty when I got here, I'm like, man, I'm coming ready to go fresh for three days, and you guys have been just pushing that plow, you've had your hands to the plow, you've been worshiping, you've been seeking, you've been praying, you've been sowing seeds, you've been believing, you've been shouting, you've been dancing, you've been crying, you've just been moving forward, and it's just so encouraging for me to come and to join in with what God has already been doing in and through you uh, since the beginning, and even before, of course, your camp meeting. Uh, tonight, I greet you on behalf of my wife, Erica, my two children. They were able to come. Uh, I was really hoping they'd be able to come and join me, uh, but they just weren't able to. So I greet you on behalf of them. And just thank you, Pastor Marty, and for the rest of the staff uh, for giving me the opportunity and entrusting this platform and this pulpit uh, to me to come and share the word. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to... You know, as we were worshiping, the Lord kind of shifted what I was going to share. In fact, what I was going to share tonight, I'm going to wait until tomorrow. And uh, I feel like this is what the Holy Spirit wants me uh, to share with you this evening. And you have been on a theme of standing together and dreaming together. And how many of you know that as a church, if you stand together and you dream together, God can show up and do amazing and miraculous things through the body of Christ? If you believe it, can you say amen? He can work wonders and he can work miracles. And I love how God desires to do that through his people, through you and through I. Standing together and dreaming together, to me, points to a sign of unity. And we know that Christ desires for his church to be a united church, not a divided church. But church, listen, there's something that has crept into the body of Christ that makes it very difficult for us to stand together and to dream together. There's a, an attack of the enemy. There's a scheme, a plan. There's a... Uh, 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 an agenda that the enemy has to have us as members of the body of Christ get stuck in a particular habit that really makes it challenging for us to stand together and to dream together. And I feel like tonight I want to share with you what this is. I believe that in order to stand together and to dream together, the Lord wants us to make sure that we have a healthy voice. Can you say healthy voice? To have a healthy voice. And I want to start by reading in James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. The 12th verse. As you're turning there, as Pastor Marty said, my name is Pastor Nick Zamorano. I come from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a graduate of American Indian College. Met my wife there. Her parents met uh, <clears throat> there. And uh, my kids are going to meet their spouses there, I always tell everybody. <laughs> and just keep the tradition going to the glory of God. Amen. We pastor a church in Surprise. It's a, a little city. Uh, well, it's a big city city now on the west side of the Phoenix area, and uh, the church we pastor is called Valley Church, Iglesia del Valle, and uh, we have just been so blessed uh, to pastor there, and uh, again, we I'm just so excited that I'm here with you this evening. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12, 
Oh, and for tomorrow, Pastor, when I heard loud and clear, because there's nothing, is I have to preach short. And so I'll try my best to do that so no one leaves in the middle of the sermon. How many of you are ready to receive from the Lord tonight? Amen. You know, we're going to read the scripture in a moment, but I was thinking about something. There is power in expectancy. There was a study that was done several years ago where they took a group of people who considered themselves to be lucky. Now, I don't believe in luck. I believe I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. But there was a study where they wanted to see what the difference was in a group of people who considered themselves to be somewhat lucky. Or they feel like things go their way, that they seem to have opportunities, there's always things going in their favor. And they also wanted to see and study another group that felt like things never happen to them that are good or that are productive, that they don't feel lucky, that they always feel like they're uh, uh, struggling and they never feel like they have an opportunity or get the break that they're looking for, for. So what they did was they grabbed these two different groups of people and they took somebody and they went to a mall, a very busy shopping center, and they dropped money at the entrance to the mall. They started with the group that feels like they're, 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 they're never lucky, things never happen to them that are good, and so they let them go first. And the majority of that group walked right over the money, didn't even see it, just walked into the store and did not see uh, the, the money laying on the floor. Then they did the experiment with the other group who felt like good things always happen to them, and about 80% of the people in that group saw the money when they were walking into the store. What does that mean? I believe that means that if you're looking for a blessing, that if you're looking for something good to happen to you, if you're looking for God to move in your life, if you have an expectancy, then you're going to find what you're looking for. Uh -huh. But if you come and you're like, I'm tired, you know, we've been at it for eight days, you've just come, you know, I've got all that I wanted, I'm ready, I've had enough, I've had my fill. Maybe you're sitting here tonight feeling like you're not going to receive something new or something special from the Lord. I want to challenge you today to expect God to still move in your life and bless you and touch you for his honor and for his glory. Amen. How many of you want the Lord to move? Say amen. Praise the Lord. All right, let's get to the word. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. In fact, stand with me, please, for the reading of God's word one more time. We'll pray and then you may be seated. James chapter 3, verse 1 through 12 says... Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue, everybody say the tongue, is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest like the beautiful one you live in, is set on fire by just a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Oh, but verse 8. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, fully, full of deadly poison. 
With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive your word tonight, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would continue to speak to this body of Christ that has diligently, it reminds me of the day of Pentecost, the believers gathered in the upper room and they waited for the promise of the Father. And they stayed and they tarried and they prayed and they sought you until that day came when the sound of a mighty rushing wind came from heaven. Tongues of fire separated and sat over them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And Lord, it was because there was a tarrying, there was a waiting for the promise. And I believe, Lord, that all week long, even last week, from the beginning of this camp meeting, your people have been tearing, Lord, and you've been moving, and you've been blessing them, and you've been rejuvenating them, and injecting them with vision and with new lives to keep running this race, but we pray tonight, God, that you would do it again. Lord, we pray tomorrow that you would do it again, and we pray that on Friday you would do it again, but help us tonight, Lord, to see how important this is that we learn how to have a healthy voice. If you want us to stand together and to dream together, we have to have a voice that's united, Lord. And so I pray for unity in this house tonight. Help me to speak this message, Lord, and help everyone to receive it. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus, your son. And everybody said, amen. Amen, and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You see, our voice is more than just the sound that comes out of your mouth. Your voice is what expresses your opinion and your attitude. Your voice is attached to your character, and it's actually the vehicle utilized to reveal, to vocalize, and to proclaim what's actually seated in the depths of your heart. If you're going to check your pulse as a community of believers, I know we've gathered together from different churches and we want to stand together, we want to dream together, we want to be the body of Christ that God wants us to be. And if we're going to be a healthy body, we have to spend time examining our voice and the power that comes from our mouths. We've all said things that we wish we can take back. We've yelled at people. I know not here, some people have gossiped, not here, right, but in other places. About others, we've lied to others. But you know what's amazing is with the same mouth, we've counseled someone. We've tried to encourage them. We've tried to offer direction, comfort. We've even praised God most high with the same mouth using the same tongue. Why is it so difficult at times to control our mouth and to tame our tongues? I want us to understand that there is power in your mouth and there's power in your voice. There's power to bless or to curse. There's power to encourage and to discourage. There's power to restore or there's power to reject. There's power to forgive or there's power to resent. There's power to spread truth and there's power to spread deceit. There's power to speak life and even to cause death. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruits. And so tonight for the next few moments I want us to see the powerful tool that you have 
which is your voice, and how the Lord would desire for us to use that voice. Tonight, I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to evaluate our lives and see and answer this question, is the Lord the Lord of your mouth? And see how our voice has victory. Also see how our words can really wreck others if we're not careful. And how ultimately your mouth mirrors what's in your heart. If you're ready, say I'm ready. Amen. Number one. Who's the master of your mouth? In 1866, Alfred Noble invented dynamite. And it was going to be used to help build bridges and roads. And it was going to be used to ultimately help people move about their life more effectively and efficiently. That's what it was designed for. It would be used, though, to also wage war and destroy lives and inflict tremendous pain and trauma upon families. You see, this dynamite that was invented could be used for good purposes or evil intentions. And our tongues are like dynamite. They too can be used, like we've said already, to build up and to edify, or your mouth can be used to tear down and to destroy. You see, when God created the world, he did so with his words. In Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of verse 3, it tells us, and God said. And God said. Think about it. From the simple command of the power and the infinite wisdom and sovereignty of God's voice, all he had to do was say, let there be this and let there be that. And there came into existence what did not exist before. God brought life with a simple command and with the authority of his voice and his words. We also see the opposite happen later on in Genesis chapter 3 when someone else comes with their voice. Satan in the form of a serpent. Cunning and sneaky he came and he used words also, but this time not to build up, not to create, but to destroy and bring destruction and death into the world. You see, church, our speech is a life-giving or life-destroying tool. And if you look at James 3, we, we see that there are cases when we use our tongue purposely for wrongdoing. In other words, we're intentionally using our voice to bring harm, to bring fear, to destroy, to tear down, and to create issues. And we have to ask ourselves, though, is it possible to use our voice in a manner that's not pleasing to the Lord and not even realize that we're doing it. Look real quick with me at the example of Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. Matthew 16, verse 21 through 23. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Here's Peter thinking he's doing the Lord a favor, right? He says, oh, no, 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 no. And he rebukes him uh, uh, and he says, never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And in verse 23, Jesus turns and he says to Peter, get behind me, who? Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, Jesus said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You know, this amazes me. And I like what Dr. Tony Evans, who is the pastor of a church called Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Texas, he says something so powerful about this. He says, even well-intentioned speech without being biblically informed can be disastrous talk. Wow. So that means be careful who you go to with advice. They might be smart. They might be educated. But are they holy? Do they know Jesus? Do they know the word? And are they going to steer you in the ways of the Lord or not? Because well-intentioned. 
well-intentioned speech, if it doesn't have the wisdom and the counsel and the sprinkling and the flavor of the word, it can be disastrous to your life. We have to, uh, or we need our speech to, it, to be influenced by the Lord of our lives and by his word. And so I ask you, who is the master of your mouth? Jesus needs to be the Lord of our life. Would you agree? Yes. Come on. Jesus needs to be the Lord of our lives. Would you agree? Yes. But he also needs to be the Lord of your lips. And not just the Lord of your life. When Jesus died, he didn't only die to save our lives. But he died to control our mouths. And to influence our life, our thoughts our conduct, and yes, even the very voice that we have. And look how powerful our words can be when Jesus is the Lord of our life and of our lips. Look at Mark chapter 11, verse 23 through 25. Mark chapter 11, verse 23 through 25. It says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. You see, this scripture comes when Jesus curses a fig tree that was not producing fruit. And not too long after Jesus cursed the fig tree, the disciples walked by that fig tree and they noticed that the fig tree had withered and it had died. And the disciples wondered, how is this possible? How could that happen? How could you have cursed that tree and it actually obeyed and listened and shriveled up, dried out, and it died? And Jesus told them something powerful. He said, anyone who says to this mountain. You see, a mountain was the, uh, the, the largest object in the days of Jesus that someone would be able to see. It was the, 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 the biggest thing in their perspective, the biggest obstacle, the biggest trial, the biggest impossible situation is how they viewed mountains. And a mountain, it represents temporal problems that we experience on this earth. The mountain spiritually though, and figuratively, refers to a situation, an impediment, something that has to be overcome or moved out of the way. So in this text, church, there's a faith lesson that's there, but Jesus is also teaching us that when we're facing problems, and how many of you in the room are facing problems? Uh -huh. That we should go to God with the problem, yes. Yeah. But there's times when we also need to speak to the problem. Why? Because there's authority and there's power in your voice if the Lord is the Lord of your life and the Lord of your lips. When the Lord is the master of your life, you can speak to the mountain and then speak to God and watch God do his work. Authority comes and you begin to see things change in your situation, in your family, in your community, on your reservation, in your lives. And so who is the master of your life and who is the Lord of your lips? If we don't submit our tongues to the Lordship of Christ, we will have to, or we won't have, excuse me, the life-giving authority and power in our voices that he wants us to have. But if we do, there's victory in your voice. Turn to your neighbor and tell them there's victory in your voice. Make him the Lord of your lips. Amen. Number two, your voice has victory. Come on, your voice has victory. Victory through I love the story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 through 12. We see the story of when King Jehoshaphat, he felt oppression from all sides. And after he told God 
God about his pain. And after King Jehoshaphat told God about his problem and his circumstances, he called the people together. And what did they do? They came together and they fell and they worshiped. And how many of you know that's a good thing to do? When there's a problem in your home, when there's a problem in your marriage, when there's a problem with your kids, when there's a problem with your grandkids, when there's a problem in your community like last week when this police officer got shot. I mean, that echoed all across the state. I heard it in Phoenix. I got a notification on my phone, on my news app about the tragedy that hit your community. And when there's a tragedy like that, when there's a problem like that, when there's pain like that, it's good to get together, stand together, dream together, pray together, and believe together that God is going to come through in your situation. They fell and they worshipped. They told God that they didn't know what to do. And you know, that's not a bad place to be. I don't always know what I should do. People come to the office or come or call me, Pastor, I'm going through this or that. I don't always have the answer. Sometimes I don't know what to do. But what I do know is that there's power and victory in praise and in worship. And it can turn situations around. And I love what they did. They worshiped and they praised. And after they worshiped, and after they praised, the Lord sent an ambush against their enemies. You see, church, tonight, you and I can praise God amid our problems and have God meet us right in the middle of our pain. And we can find victory in our voice. Of course, the type of voice we have is what makes all the difference. You see, you can complain, you can curse, you can grumble, you can grunt, you can moan, you can complain. And if you do that, you will not find victory. Or you can praise God and experience the victory that you desperately need in your life. Why is that? Because God's address is praise. Some of you in the room have been searching for God. You're looking for him. You feel like he's not there, that you can't find him. Well, have you praised him? Because his address is praise. You want to get a hold of God? You want to write him a letter? You want to talk to him on the phone? You begin by praising the Lord. And he comes and he meets you. And he dwells and inhabits in the praises of his people. If you want to locate him, you do it with your praise. When you open your mouth, when you seek him, when you worship him, when you love on him, when you adore him and praise him, he makes his presence known. Look at Paul and look at Silas. Acts chapter 16, verse 24 and 25. Turn there with me. Acts 16, 24 and 25. <coughs> The fried bread oil is getting to my throat. Amen. <laughs> the smoke. So, Acts 16, 24, and 25. Gerald Altahol told me if a bug went in my throat, just keep on preaching. And I think that's what happened. <laughs> Acts 16, 24, and 25. When he received these orders... He put them in the inner cell and he fastened their feet in the stocks. And about midnight, Paul and Silas, what were they doing? They were praying. Come on, what were they doing? They were praying, but they were also doing something else. They were singing, right? They were singing hymns to God. They were singing victory in Jesus. They were singing, I've been washed by the blood. I don't know. They were singing, this is the day the Lord has made. They were singing hymns to the Lord. And the other prisoners were what? Listening to them. So Paul and Silas, they're in chains. They're locked up during the darkest hour of the night and they decide to use the power that we're talking about that is located here in the voice. And they began to praise the Lord. They raised their voices and it was loud enough that the other prisoners could hear them. The prisoners couldn't hear them if they were like this. 
And sometimes we like to pray that way. And that's okay. But sometimes we got to stand up. We just got to lift our voices and let people hear what we're crying out and what we're asking and what we're requesting and what we're believing for. And they raised their voices and others could hear them and they praised God. And God showed up and he revealed his power and the earth shook, the chains fell and those prison gates, oh, they swung wide open to the glory of God. You know, I love how they praised God together. You know, this tells me that you got to find someone who's going to praise God with you. Because if you're going through something, find that person who you can call, find that person who you can knock on their door, regardless of what hour it is of the night, who's going voice with you yeah. and encourage you yeah. because they're going to use their tongue to praise God alongside of you. Amen. Don't call that person, that auntie that's like, ah, well, that's what you get. You know, we all call that auntie over and over again. Even in Hispanic culture, we call them tias. We got that tia. Well, that's what you get, mijo. You got what's coming to you. You don't need that. You're already struggling. You already feel discouraged. Don't call that person who's going to say, well, that's just how it's going to be. You just need to make adjustments now. Sorry, there's nothing that I can do. No, 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 no. Instead, find someone who's going to say, guess what? God is in control. He's got the final say. Worthy is the name of the Lord who's going to praise God with you. Find a praise buddy, I call him. Tap, tap your neighbor and say, hey, be my praise buddy. Can you be my It's biblical. Like, who's this bald guy talking about a praise buddy? It's biblical. Psalm 34 3 Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name, not by ourselves. It says, Together. Praise the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Can you say amen? Are you still with me? Okay, that was my introduction. I'm just kidding. Down. I don't know why I'm preaching so fast. It's like, relax. Yeah. Let's calm down. It's a camp meeting. There's not lunch afterwards. We all try to beat the Baptists down the street at our church. Too. There's also victory through using our words wisely and building up others. So there's victory through praise, but there's also victory through using your words wisely and building up others. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful. Is what's coming out of your mouth helpful or is it destructive? Helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You see, church, we need to use our words to edify, to build up, and to encourage one another. How in the world are we going to stand together and dream together if we're not going to encourage and edify one another? You know, what did God tell you? Ah, oh, that's not God. Oh, what's your dream? Oh, that's not a good dream. Oh, that's too small. Well, that's the, and that's the, and you're just having a poopy party on everybody's dream that they're getting from God. Because you're using your words to destroy and not to edify. When you're interacting with others, it's good to think about what Jesus would say to them and how he would say it. You know, Colossians 4, 6 says, let your conversation be always full of grace. Oh, seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, do people avoid you? Maybe it's because you have no salt in your speech. Maybe it's because you've got no grace in your communication. And you're quick to point the finger. And you're quick to judge. And you're quick to nag. And you're quick to yell. And you're quick to complain. Rather than show grace and mercy when people need it. Ephesians 4.15. Instead speaking the truth, we got to do it. But what? In love. We will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. God wants us to stand together and dream together. We're not just one member, we're many. Well, this scripture 
Scripture tells us how we can grow into the mature body of Christ. It's by speaking truth in love so that we can grow. You see, sometimes we can be harsh with our words, especially when we know what the person, uh, excuse me, when we know that the person who we are talking to needs rebuke and needs correction. Sometimes we got to tell them. But even if we're needing to direct or correct someone, we still do it in love. There's an appropriate way to speak the truth, and there's an inappropriate way. One way brings offense, feelings of condemnation, and even bondage to those who are receiving it, while speaking the truth in love provides an open door for victory and restoration and healing in that person's life. And this is the kind of voice that I believe God wants us to have tonight. And may we use our words to build up one another, edify each other, and help one another grow and to mature in the relationship with Christ. Speak life to each other and express the victory that we have in our voice. Church, number one, who's the master of your mouth? Number two, there's victory in your voice. And number three, I want us to look more deeply at the wreckage of your words. Maybe tonight you thought I was going to preach about the fire of the Holy Ghost, but what we were seeing earlier, Holy Spirit speak through me. How can he if we got filthy mouths? How can we if we don't take the time to examine our hearts? How can he if we don't allow the Lord to do what the prophet Isaiah allowed to, the Lord to do? Lord, get the coal. Touch my lips, Lord. Purify me. Here I am. Use me as a vessel and help me speak words of life, healing, liberty, and, and peace to those around me. The wreckage of your words. You see, there was a woman who once went into the doctor because she was bitten by a dog. Maybe it was a res dog. I don't know. She got bit by a dog. And she went to the doctor and the doctor looked at her and checked out her wound and they drew some 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 some, some blood from her and, 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 and he went away into another office and then he came back and he said, I got some, some bad news for you. What is it, doctor? You know, you got bit by a dog that has rabies. Oh, the dog has rabies. And, you know, it's, it's, it's in your bloodstream now. And so she began to pull out a paper and she began to write as the doctor was trying to explain what rabies is and how it affects the body. And she began to write this paper. And he said, what are you doing? Are you writing a list of all the names of people you want to tell that you got bit by rabies? And she said, no, I'm writing a list of all the people I want to bite. <laughs> There's no one like that in this house. I'm gonna get everybody. I'm gonna get my mom. I'm gonna get my auntie. I'm gonna get my grandma. I'm gonna get my, I'm gonna get my son. My grandson. I'm gonna get my neighbor. I'm gonna get Pastor Marty. Pastor Christian. Ah. You see, we can use our mouths to do a lot of harm. Harm that we're trying to reciprocate to others because it's been done to you. Grateful heart. Do you have a grateful heart? Do you speak life into others? Do you do others rush to see you or to talk to you because they know they're going to be lifted up, they're going to be encouraged, they're going to be edified, or do they run from you because they know that they're going to be judged? condemned, gossiped about, slandered upon. Tonight, God, I believe, wants to bring healing to people's hearts. Some of us, like I said earlier, have been living with rabies because of the words that have been spoken to us. Some of you in this room were told that you would never amount to anything, that your failure was going to define you, and that became the destiny that you walked in up to this point. You were told names, made fun of, perhaps bullied, teased. Maybe someone throughout your childhood never 
encouraged you or said the words, I love you, I'm here for you, I trust you, you can trust me. Maybe they never built you up. Instead, they only lied to you and brought you down. And because of that, you're now seeing that you are now going around and you're gossiping about others. You're slandering on others. You're complaining about everything. You're cursing others. You're rebuking others. There's no salt in your speech. There's no grace and there's no love in the truth that you try to communicate. I believe that God tonight wants to liberate you, wants to free you, wants to heal you, wants to turn that around so that you can have a voice of victory that he desperately wants to give you tonight, right here and right now. Maybe you're in the room and you have been a person who struggles with thanksgiving. Maybe you've not been as grateful as you should be, and I want to challenge you tonight that as we come and as we pray to just reflect upon the goodness of God. He's been so good in every season. The Lord gives and he also takes away, but what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is always faithful. He is always on time. He is always good. He loves you. He sees you. He knows you. He cares for you. And tonight, I believe, he wants to touch you. He wants to give you victory in your voice. Amen. We're going to pray and I'm going to open up the altar. We want to pray for you tonight. If you need healing in your heart, if you need maybe uh, to have a different perspective uh, so in your heart so that you can be grateful and, 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 and no longer be the person that has the voice God does not want you to have, tonight we want to pray for you that God is going to do something great in and through your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, all week long, you've been working in our lives. You've been preparing us. You've been pushing us forward. You've been filling us with power from on high. And we thank you for the move of your spirit that has happened up to this point, Lord. But God, I believe tonight you want to do something very specific. And you want to operate on our hearts, Lord, so that our mouths can reflect what our heart is feeling. But Lord, we need to have a surgery, a process in the heart, God. And so I pray tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus, for every person from the left to the right, from the back to the front in this house, Lord, that God, if they have been lied to, if they have been gossiped about, if they have been put down, if they have been slandered upon, that, Lord, the effects of the spiritual rabies that has spread throughout not only individuals, but I believe throughout families represented in this room, tonight it stops, Lord. Tonight we get the remedy for the spiritual rabies. Tonight we have the antidote injected inside of us, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit, so that, Lord, we can receive the healing that we need to no longer reciprocate what's been done to us. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray all throughout this room, you would begin to speak to hearts. You would begin to tug on hearts. You would begin to prompt hearts to respond to your word. And as we worship you in spirit and in truth, I believe, Lord, you're going to unleash healing in this place and victory, God, in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. And amen. Tonight, if you need prayer for any of those things as we worship the Lord before we transition tonight, I want to encourage you to come. Come. Maybe you need to bring your neighbor. Maybe they don't have the strength themselves to come forward and to receive the healing that you know and they know they need. Remember, there's no judgment here. Ain't nobody going to gossip about you afterwards. At least they better not. Or all the pastors in this house are going to come talk to you. Amen. But tonight, God wants to bring healing into hearts. I believe it. And so allow him to do it in this moment. Come, 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 come. And allow the Lord to work in us for the glory of God.